The Diels Alder reaction, or 4 plus 2 cycloaddition, is one of the most beloved and one of the most important reactions in all of organic chemistry. And it's so important because it is so darn useful synthetically. It builds up a lot of molecular complexity in a single reaction flask, in a single reaction step. And so it's great for the synthesis of complex organic structures, which tends to lead to complex functions. In this video, we're going to introduce the Diels-Alder reaction, which is certainly the most famous and most important pericyclic reaction. And in the language we've developed so far, the Diels-Alder reaction is a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition involving a 4 pi component, a pi system consisting of 4 atoms, a conjugated diene, as we've described them previously, and a 2 atom or 2 pi component, which can be as simple as a carbon-carbon double bond, for example, in ethylene. This is a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. Most Diels-Alder reactions proceed through concerted pericyclic mechanisms, meaning there are no ionic intermediates. And we're going to focus on those in this course because they're relatively easy to understand and relatively easy to predict the outcome of. Stepwise examples of Diels-Alder reactions are known, and when the rules that we'll develop in this series of videos break down, that's a good sign you're looking at a stepwise cycloaddition situation. But in a typical pericyclic Diels-Alder reaction, the electron flow looks like this, and this is familiar from our studies of cycloaddition previously. We've got two distinct pi systems coming together to form a ring. Here, notice it's a cyclohexene ring with six atoms and a carbon-carbon double bond. Other types of related structures can be made using Diels-Alder reactions, but they're always six-membered rings, and they always include at least one degree of unsaturation on top of the ring, a double bond, or uh, two double bonds, potentially. The 4 pi component is simply called the diene, and we've used this term before to describe a conjugated structure with two double bonds separated by a single bond. It's referred to as the diene. The 2 pi component is called the dienophile. It's not always an alkene. It can also be an alkyne or related structures with multiple bonds. So we call it, to generalize, the dienophile. This is the component that loves the diene, right? It wants to react with the diene. That's why it's called the dienophile. And we're going to use these terms throughout our exploration of the Diels-Alder reaction. The diene, 4 pi component, reacts with the dienophile, the 2 pi component. Now, high temperatures can promote what's called the retro Diels-Alder reaction. Retro here is a term we use to refer to the reverse process, which is going to correspond to the cyclo-elimination, we might say, of a six-membered cyclohexene ring like this back to a 2 pi component and a 4 pi component. And this is favored at high temperatures because, as you might imagine, delta S for the process is greater than zero. The entropy change is positive since we're going from one starting material to two products. And another thing worth mentioning is if you look at the electron flow in this step, you'll notice that it's actually very similar to the electron flow for the Diels-Alder reaction itself. This sigma bond breaks, these pi electrons shift over, and this sigma bond also breaks. And that's not a coincidence, right? This is typical of pericyclic reactions, that they can be reversible, and the electron flow in both directions, forward and reverse, is cyclic. And that's going on here. So the Diels-Alder reaction is a fantastic reaction that establishes a six-membered ring, two new sigma bonds in the product that are worth highlighting. Let's go ahead and highlight those new sigma bonds in this first example here and here. And we can build up a lot of molecular complexity in a very short time. One other thing to notice is that the Diels-Alder reaction can establish up to four new tetrahedral stereocenters at the two ends of the diene, there and there, and at the two carbons of the dienophile. That stereochemistry is predictable and actually follows relatively well-behaved rules, which is fantastic. We get great stereochemical control in a lot of Diels-Alder reactions. Now let's talk a little bit more about the nature of the dienophile and the diene and Diels-Alder reactions. And let's start with the dienophile. At the top of this slide, we see an observation that's actually pretty interesting. The parent Diels-Alder reaction, the simplest Diels-Alder reaction we can imagine between 1,3-butadiene and ethylene, actually doesn't work very well. It takes very high temperatures, 200 degrees C, and we only get about 20% yield out of this reaction. That's not great. <laughs> but if we replace one of the hydrogens on ethylene, with a formal or, or aldehyde group, all of a sudden the reaction becomes a lot 
faster and a lot more effective. We get quantitative yield of the cyclohexene, the formal substituted cyclohexene, at much, much lower temperatures, closer to room temperature. Here's a third example that is even faster. If we take that formal substituted alkene and we take the diene and add a methoxy group to it, this reaction is even faster and will go at room temperature and again give quantitative 100% yield of the cyclohexene product. So substituents on the dienophile lower the activation energy and accelerate deals all the reactions. And the same is true of the diene. And generally what we want to do is polarize the diene and dienophile so that one looks and acts more like a nucleophile and the other looks and acts more like an electrophile. The diels alder reaction is stereospecific with respect to the configuration of the dienophile. So for alkene dienophiles, we can have, for example, cis alkenes with the two substituents on the same side of the double bond or trans alkenes with the two substituents on opposite sides of the double bond. And those configurations are maintained in the cyclohexene product. So if we start cis, for example, that's the situation here. We're starting in a cis alkene configuration. That cis configuration is maintained in the cyclohexene product. The X substituents here remain cis. Likewise, if we start trans with X substituents on the opposite sides of the double bond, we end up with a trans cyclohexene hexene product with the two X substituents on opposite sides of the cyclohexene ring. And this is a consequence of the concerted pericyclic nature of the reaction. Both sigma bonds are formed at the same time, and so both X substituents get kind of pushed in the same direction or opposite directions, depending on if they start out cis or trans. And so those stereochemical relationships are maintained in the cyclohexene products. This slide just shows us some other possibilities for the dienophile. It does not need to be a carbon-carbon double bond. It can be a carbon-carbon triple bond, part of an alkyne, and the electron flow is exactly analogous. The only difference, quite literally, the only difference is we've got an extra double bond right here. We're missing a pair of hydrogens. So there are no cis-trans issues with alkynes, which is kind of nice. Things are relatively simple. This means we end up with an extra double bond in the product, and now we have not a cyclohexene, but a 1,4 cyclohexadiene with two double bonds within the structure. And this can be useful because these double bonds can be used for further chemistry. The double or triple bond does not need to involve only carbons. A heteroatom can be involved. For example, a carbonyl group, the CO double bond, can act as a dienophile. And this example is nice because it highlights this idea that we often want to bias the diels alder reaction, making the diene more nucleophilic and the dienophile more electrophilic, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. This diene is electron-rich, it's nucleophilic, and it's worth pausing the video to convince yourself why that's the case. On the other hand, the 2-pi component, the carbonyl component here, is electrophilic, and again, it's worth pausing to make sure you understand why that's the case. This biasing with an electron-rich diene and electron-poor dienophile makes this reaction work fantastically. And actually, I'm realizing I've forgotten a double bond in the product. There should be a double bond right there. But notice now we've got not a, not a cyclohexene ring, but a six-membered ring containing an oxygen within the ring. And again, this is nice for further elaboration. This group, which we'll encounter later in the course, actually, this particular functional group with two oxygens linked to a common carbon, can be used for further chemistry.